Hey, y'all. CB here, the No BS Welder here at NBS Welding. Did you ever get up on Sunday morning and just think, wonder what CB's doing? Sure you yeah, have. That's why you're here. See what I'm doing, ain't it? Well, look. Something's come up recently where uh, I got a set of sign. Uh, it's about 19 feet off the ground. I got a set of sign frame. And uh, I was talking with my buddy about using his excavator to set that thing. And uh, something we had talked about before, he's got the Bobcat Quick Attach on his excavator. And um, he's got another buddy that's asked him before about setting trusses and stuff with the excavator. Uh, we kind of get into that where it's pretty common to have tools and materials being used in ways for which they were never intended. Um, he set I-beams with skid steers and uh, just stuff we do. But uh, we had had the thought, uh, and he had mentioned before, where he had the thought of building some kind of a attachment, a gin pole or a, a pig pole, whatever you'd call it, that would be like a bobcat quick attach that would go on his excavator and turn it into a little baby crane. I think that's a good idea. Now, that guy's busy, and I don't know how easy it's going to be for us to get together or when we want to get together to... Uh, to set this sign but obviously what it's done to me is it's made me think about what I've got that I could set something with now years ago when I was welding for the drilling industry I'll tell you a little story about something I did uh, when we stopped using weld on wellheads uh, we started the, the the industry started using a, a weld on low grain which was uh it was a better deal in a lot of ways because when we used to weld 13 inch or 9 inch well heads on the casing there was a drilling rig sitting there and that drilling rig being there uh that meant the crew was standing there waiting the air hands the mud hands the mud man anybody on the site was waiting on this welder to weld on a wellhead. Well, they, uh, the wellhead supply companies and, and wellhead stack equipment companies came up with a load ring design that allowed us to go to the site and weld a ring on the 20 inch conductor pipe before any rigs even got there, before the big rig even got there. You know, the 20 inch conductor was set by a little auger rig. Uh, but the auger rig would come in and set the conductor and they would cement that 20 inch conductor pipe in the ground. And before the big rig got there, we could go out there and weld a 20 inch load ring onto that, onto that 20 inch conductor pipe. And everything that, that the, everything that the wellhead company needed done from there on out with regards to that stack could be done with nuts and bolts and set screws and O-rings and stuff. So, that prevented the entire operation from sitting there waiting on a welder, which was obviously a good uh, a good deal for everybody. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about this, where we had these multi-well pads, uh, you know, sometimes we'd need six, eight, ten of them load rings put on on one well pad and since it was done without the big rig or any rig needing to be there uh they would have the auger rig go out and set all those conductors on the pad and then as the welder i would go out there and weld on all those load rings on the pad sometimes 10 or, or 12 of them at a time you would go right down through the line cutting the cap off that conductor pipe and welding that 20 inch load ring onto the conductor and then move to the next one and you could get all of them done 
before that big rig even got there, which was good. Well, that prompted me to think about how I was cutting the pipe, which obviously you flame cut your pipe with a torch. Uh, considering that there was this many of these conductors to do, I bought a 20 inch pipe beveling machine, which I could latch onto the pipe and just crank a handle and the torch walked around, cut it off. It was really fast, made a square cut, uh, did a good job. $5,000 machine, but it was worth it. Um, that prompted me to getting paid by the conductor, not by the hour. You know, uh, I made an agreement with the outfit that uh, I would get paid so much per well, not per hour. So it made it worth it to me to make this operation as fast as I could make it. Well, that led me to realizing how big this 20-inch beveling machine I had was and the time I spent actually handling the machine. Well, I ended up making... I ended up making a... Uh, a hoisting device that hung off the side of my welding truck with an electric winch with a wireless control and that's how I held that beveling machine. Now you can, if you think about this and visualize it, you could see how much faster I got by doing it this way. But I literally, there's 12 of those conductor pipes 10 feet apart running down through uh, 10, 15, 20 feet apart, I can't remember, but they were a straight line. Well, I had this, uh, I had this, this boom hanging off the side of my truck. With a winch out there on the end. And I was driving right down through that line and I would drive up to the first well, take the wireless remote, let the 20 inch bevel machine down, latch it on the pipe, cut off the pipe, hit my remote, lift it up, drive to the next well, back down, cut it back up, drive to the next. So you can see how fast, you know, I was, I was cutting these 20 inch conductors like lightning compared to marking around it with a wrap around, cutting it off with a hand torch, you know, all of that. I was really getting fast at it. And, uh, so it was another occasion where I, I needed something specific for a job and I built it. Uh, the way that hung off the side of my truck and I could drive right down that road cutting those conductors off, it was awesome. Uh, I don't do that kind of work anymore, but thinking about uh, hanging this sign 19 feet in the air, the sign frame that I need to lift is not really very heavy. Uh, it's 10 foot, pretty much 10 foot by 4 foot. And it's made out of 2 by 2 by 1 8 rectangular tubing. Got some paint on it there. While that paint's curing, I'm thinking about how I'm going to set this thing. And I'm wondering, you know, I've thought for quite a while about things I could build for my tractor. And there's some things that I really need to build for my tractor because I could use them around here. Um, so I, I've got the idea in mind of how I could apply and use the winch, the wireless winch that I used to use on my, uh, on my side boom off, off my truck for conductors. You know, could I use that to set this sign? Well, weight-wise... Uh, that 2,500 pound winch is way more than I need. So we're good there. Um, it's built into a frame where I can, I made it so that you can put it in like a two inch hitch in your truck. So it's very adaptable. Anywhere I put a two and a half inch receiver that'll accept that two inch hitch, uh, I can pin that in there and use it. So that's great. Um, so I, I, my idea is this, I wonder if I can make a lifting device that could be carried around basically a 25 or a 30 foot tall ho hoist 
that could be carried around by my Kubota tractor, uh, which has the skid steer quick attach loader on the front, and, you know, use the tractor to set that thing up and carry it around in a way that I could use my wireless winch to lift something like a sign to put in place. Well, there's one thing that I learned about my tractor real early. Uh, it needs weight on the back of it to lift. And that brings me to a whole nother idea I've had for a long time about uh, even though my tractor's pretty small, the three-point hitch on the back will lift a lot. Uh, I watched a video before I bought this tractor where uh, there was a guy that didn't believe that a B2601 Kubota tractor's three-point hitch would lift a ton. So he literally took weights and, and, and piled on to the back, onto the three-point hitch of one of these tractors uh, until he got up to like a ton or more of weight to see if it would lift it. And he ran out of weight but was still lifting it. So the third arm, or the the three-point hitch on one of these tractors will lift a crazy amount of weight. And that has always made me want to have a set of forks on the back of my tractor, where you could lift things up with forks and carry them around uh, with the back of the tractor. Well, now that takes us back to what I found out quickly about the loader. Uh, the, the, as soon as I got this tractor and I had the loader on it and I had the pallet forks on the skid steer quick attach, I went to lift something and the hydraulics of the tractor would lift way more than what the tractor could lift because I was picking the rear tires up off the ground. Uh, now that wouldn't happen if I had my if I have my backhoe attachment on the back, that would give you a bunch of weight. But you're not going to pick up your backhoe attachment every time you want weight. And there is going to be times when you want to pick up something with the back of the tractor um, and carry it around. And I have an extra set of forks here that I bought off a buddy of mine used quite some time ago. So if you can see what I'm getting at, there's a few things I'm thinking of right now. One thing being, uh, can I build something that would go on the loader on the skid steer quick attach of my tractor to use as a, a hoisting device so that I can utilize the 2,500 pound winch that I've got that little rig um, to set something like this sign that I'm going to be, this sign frame that I'm going to be setting soon. Well, if I'm going to do that, one thing I'm going to need is some weight in the back. Well, if I need weight in the back, if I'm going to make something useful, I should go ahead and make that set of forks. Because if I had forks for the back of the tractor, I could use them to pick things up and carry them around with the three-point hitch of the tractor. The other thing was, if I ever want to use the loader to lift something and I need weight in the back, well, if I had the forks on the back, I could just pick up something. Pick up whatever I wanted. Or maybe even, you know, if you were out on site using the, using the lifting device on the loader to set something and you just wanted to secure the tractor... You could put the two wide forklift forks together, set them down on the ground, and park one wheel of a super service truck on it. Now, obviously, if you do that, that tractor, it's pretty pinned down. Uh, super service truck's heavy. So, I think the right place to start here is to consider building something like a set of, like a frame for a set of forks and put forks on the back of the tractor. If I can successfully get forks on the back of the tractor, then I know I can weight the back of the tractor, which fixes a lot of my problems with the front loader being able to lift 
uh, without lifting the rear wheels off the ground of the tractor. So uh, I think the way this is going to start out here on this beautiful Sunday morning, I'm um, going to put the I'm going to put the three-point hitch arms on the back of the tractor. They're on my, they're actually on my tiller right now, but I'm going to put those on there. We'll take a look at that. Maybe run and go get some pins. Uh, make a frame that'll hold the, the old used set of forks I bought and see if we can get a set of forks put on the back of this tractor. Uh, let me show you the tractor real quick. You might have seen this. It's been in videos before. I have the Kubota B2601. Uh, I've got the 60-inch mower deck with it. Uh, I have the loader. I have the backhoe. I have a set of pallet forks and a bucket that go on the skid steer quick attach and the tiller. So I'm going to take the arms off the tiller, stick them on the tractor, get the tractor in the shop, and start brainstorming ideas to get a set of forks on the back of this tractor. Stay tuned, it's going to be cool. So, around here a lot of times when I'm looking for ideas, I just look through what I got and uh, kind of put things together like that. Uh, sometimes when you're looking for parts around here, you... You need a weed eater, but we probably are going to get away without that this time. Let's take a look here. Putting forks on something, we can look at the we can look at the shyster here. What you're wanting, you got a a lip like that. So the whole idea with with what that lip does is it it holds the forks real secure. Uh, doesn't matter if you're pressing down on the fork or lifting up because there's also a lip on the bottom. So either way, that fork is going to stay on there securely, but it still gives you the ability to slide the forks in and out and change the width, which is critical with forks. Um, you run into different size pallets or different size things you want to lift and you might have to you might have to change the way that the forks uh, the width of the forks to get it to do what you want it to do right here's a set of forks that i bought off a buddy of mine years ago don't pay no mind to this thing that's off of something else but if we look at the forks see that's the lip on the bottom of the fork and then right here, that's the lip on the top. And those are, that's what's going to allow that to slide. And I took a measurement there. So from doing some calculations and, and measure, measurifications there, what I know right now is that I need a, an upper and a, a lower lip that's a half inch thick and 20 inches apart. Uh looked around here, I was actually starting to think of, the first thing I thought of was angle iron, where you'd have a an angle iron lip up and another one down. Uh, I don't have any angle iron here that's a half inch thick. So as far as what I do have, looky here what I found. This piece of I-beam, I believe that's an eight inch beam. Um, the flanges on it are a half inch thick. And it's 40 inches long, which is about the about the width I would want this thing. And I can get two pieces out of this if I just split it right down the middle. Now, I am a little bit concerned when I cut that, split that that way, that it's going to bow. It might not be as straight as it is right now. I hope that's not a huge problem. But I'm planning on trying that. Uh, that's good use of that little 40-inch piece of I-beam. You know, you can't, generally with I-beam, you can't do a whole lot with 40 inches of it. When you need an I-beam, you need a great big long piece. Uh, so we'll get some use out of that maybe. Now, that means that those two pieces 
uh, when I when I take that I beam and I split it and make two pieces out of it, those two pieces would be horizontal. Um, that's the horizontal part of our frame. Now we need a vertical part of our frame. And I was looking at the tractor and uh, figuring out, you know, the vertical parts are probably where my, my three-point hitch is going to connect. So what I'm thinking is that I'm going to have three-inch square tubing. I've got some pieces of three-inch square tubing that I found. They're three by three by quarter. And if I put three of them vertical, that would offer a lot of bracing uh, for those two pieces that run horizontal. And also, with a square tube, I could cut a hole where those three arms go back in that hole and then drill through the tubing where I can pin it. So I'm talking about some square tubes that look like this. Let's get these parts rounded up, get it all together and get it in the shop. Don't normally run a track torch horizontal, but uh, doesn't mean it won't work. These pieces of I-beam, like I said, are going to be our horizontal pieces that uh, the forks are going to latch on and slide on. So in other words, if this was the top, the part of that fork that latches on would be like that. And it could slide across, across here. And uh, of course on the bottom, it would be like that and slide. I got these notches marked and this is where I'm going to notch out, uh, I'm going to notch this out so that the three inch tubing can be inset and welded into those pieces. So that's what's next. So, uh, hope you understand everything we did so far about those two horizontal pieces, but if not, uh, stay tuned, you know, you'll, you'll smell what I'm stepping in as we go. Now, moving on, uh, to fabricate these tubes, we got to figure out, uh, some, some things, and I just kind of want to go through the process of what I'm thinking, uh, what I'm considering, you know, in order to do that, because I think with guys building stuff at home, I think this is where a lot of people like, they just don't know where to start. And, uh, I'll just, you know, maybe I can show the way I'm doing this might give you an idea of something that you're doing, but let's look at the fork. What I'm thinking on that tractor is that that right there with that fork basically setting on the floor. That's as low as I would ever want the tractor to be able to drop that fork. Now, the upper arm uh, that's adjustable on the three-point hitch could be manipulated quite a bit to change the angle of the tip right there. But I'm just saying, for the most part, to find out what we need to do on our frame, I'm just setting this fork right flat on the floor and I'm looking, whoops, sorry. I'm looking right here and uh, the bottom, 
the bottom here where, where that would latch in, the bottom lowest part of that beam would be two and a half inches from the floor. Now if we go over to the tractor with the three point hitch as low as it'll go, then what we got to the first hole from the floor, we got seven and a half inches to the center of that hole. And uh, these arms, they're all the way down. So that, that part right there is as low as it'll go. Now, the next thing to consider would be the distance between the elevation of those holes. Obviously, the elevation of those two holes are going to be the same. But now we got to make a third hole for this arm. And what I'm, what I'm using to, to decide that is the distance off of my tiller. I just, you know, I went out and looked at the difference between those pins center to center on my tiller, and it's 18 inches. So I think that's good enough to start out with there. And like I said, this arm's adjustable. This upper arm, you could thread that in and out quite a ways and make quite a bit of difference in the, the angle like this tilt you know, your frame. So the next thing I did knowing those dimensions is I just kind of did me a crude little drawing right here on the table. Uh, and the way I did this, I'm figuring, all right, the, the edge of that table is the floor. And two and a half inches from the floor, I want that thing. This is where the bottom part where we measured the two and a half inches of that fork is going to latch onto the bottom of that beam. And then we know uh, from measuring the fork from there to where we want to latch on the top, that's where we want the 20 inches. When I measured that real tight on the, uh, on the forks, I had 20 and a quarter. So... I said, I don't want it that tight. I want 20 inches. So then I draw that in with my 20 inches. So the next thing is, if I'm going from the ground, remember I said the edge of this table is the ground, up to the first hole, that would be seven and a half inches. So I sort of roughly draw that hole in there. And it looks to me like from the center of that hole to the bottom of the tube where I can weld it good, I'd be pretty good with two inches right there. And then, uh, if this is the hole in our two outer tubes, and I go up 18 inches, uh, looking at the hole in my center tube for my, for my three-point hitch at the top, uh, that's the 18 inches, and then I want to be, I want to give it two inches above that. So these tubes, all three of my tubes are going to be 22 inches long. Two of them are going to have a 15 16 hole in the bottom to accept the 7 8 inch pin that goes in the bottom there. And the center, the center tube is going to have a 13 16 hole two inches down from the top. And that's going to, uh, that's going to pin up on the 3 quarter inch pin that goes on the top, uh, top link of that three point hitch there. So, uh, that's a little rundown on, uh, you know, how I'm figuring on what I'm building here. So if we got these three tubes cut and the holes drilled, uh, we'd be ready to assemble. I think let's, let's do that. Just caught myself almost making a mistake with my hole drilling, and uh, it didn't happen. I caught it. That's cool. Uh, 
So I, I just wanted to show you what I did. I was assuming, wrongly assuming, that I would want all of these holes right in the center of the three inch tube. And uh, I did drill the 13 16 hole in the center tube that will go to the top link. And it's fine. That's fine to be in the center on it. But let me show you about the other two holes. This is the one that's 13 16 I drilled it in the center. That's going to work for the top link. That's no problem. Plenty of room there. I marked the uh, this hole in the center of that three inch tube. And if we go over and look at the tractor with the tape measure, you know, you got to figure uh, that thing's got to go into that tube. And the end of that thing at some point, this end needs to clear the front of that tube on the inside. And, uh, you know, the tube being an inch and a half thick, this is a little too close for comfort. Uh, or not an inch and a half thick, but a quarter of an inch thick. See, that's, if you put that, if you put that hole at an inch and a half, when you put this inside the tube to pin it up, this is going to hit the inside wall before you can pin that. So it's not going to work. What we want to do is we want to be two inches. Two inches from the center of this hole. To the edge and then we got plenty of room and uh, that does leave the back on a you know on a tube that's three inches wide that'll leave the back part kind of thin which is no problem uh, the strength we need to lift something is going to be pushing up so you know back's not a problem and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to ignore that side that I marked and mark, uh, mark new marks on, on this side. That'll be two inches this way and two inches down this way. And then we'll drill those 15 sixteenths and uh, we'll call that disaster averted. Now, you could fix that by cutting the front out of the tube. I don't think that's the right... I don't think that's the best way to do it. I'd rather leave that there if I could. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be fine.
So obviously, we've got the reverse problem now. I was talking about having these forks on the back so I could lift stuff with the front and easily add weight to the back by picking stuff up. And right now that I got no loader on the front or any weight on the front, I can't lift up nothing in the back because it just lifts the front of the tractor off the ground. Just like if I try to use the loader without anything on the back, it lifts the back of the tractor off the ground. Uh, but we've got a nice set of forks here. Uh, this is a hell of a rig. And I, and I kind of think these forks are too big. Uh, too big is better than too small. I mean, they're, it's something that was laying around here. I bought these forks because they'll fit the shyster. So I could slide them off of there and stick them on a shyster. If I break a fork for the shyster, these are nice to have around. But uh, I'd rather have them on an implement here that I could use than uh, just have them laying there doing nothing like they've been for a couple years. But obviously we're not going to be able to lift something like that steel dumpster uh, unless, which I believe it would lift it. I do. But you'd have to have the loader on the front, and you might even need some weight in the loader, you know, to lift a lot. Which, it would be super easy with that with that Bobcat Quick Attach on my loader. I could make a weight for the front of this thing uh, if I wanted to. And, of course, you could just take the loader bucket and pick up something or use the pallet forks I've got for the loader and pick up something but i'm not gonna put the loader on it today this is enough that uh i'm i'm gonna call it good for a lazy sunday you know what we've built here looks really good to me it's uh it's gonna work let's check it out Trying to put that together with the pin that I use for my my tiller, and the two the two pins on the bottom were long enough. That one wasn't. So I went and looked through my pins, and I found one that works, but it's way too long. That's a six-inch pin, and uh, I need one that'll do that three-inch tube. But that's fine. That'll work. I'm happy with it. I will be messing with this further on in the project, but this is it for now. I'm happy with the fork setup. Uh, we'll move on and make us a gizmo for the loader later and maybe have a lifting device that'll we can use, you know, the tractor to carry around some sort of a hoist that could be used to to lift things in the front and use these forks to put weight on the back or just carry things around. You know, there's a lot of options you can do with a a tractor tractor loader backhoe like this. And you know, you got to understand with a machine like this, it's not ideal for anything. Uh, you know, if you want to dig ditch and excavate ground, an excavator is way better than a backhoe. And I always tell people, don't compare a backhoe to an excavator. Compare a backhoe to a shovel. Uh, when you compare a backhoe to a, sho a hand shovel, that backhoe's a bad mammy jammy. Uh, you know, you take something like a tractor loader backhoe, the backhoe attachment is not ideal for excavation and digging trenches and things like, like an excavator is. But an excavator, you know, would struggle with being a loader as efficient as a skid steer. If you want a really fast and efficient loader, a skid steer is way, way better than an excavator. But a, a skid steer won't dig a ditch worth a dang. You know, you get a, some kind of bucket attachment for a skid steer, it, 
that's no good. Something like a tractor loader backhoe that'll backhoe, dig ditches, uh, has pallet forks. You got a loader. You can mow with it. It's kind of the Swiss Army knife of tractors. Uh, and it's not going to be ideal for anything, but it'll do a lot of different things. So I want to thank you all for watching. And like I always say, learn how to work with what you got. And that way you'll always have everything you need. Hey y'all, CB here at NBS Weld, and we're in the break room doing a quick merch video. For any of you that, that are interested in merchandise to help support the channel, uh, we got the stickers. Small size sticker, like a hard hat size. Three dollars. Got the bull logo, NBS Weldon, got the name and phone number. The medium size, five dollars. And then... The big bumper sticker, 10 bucks. Now, there's no shipping on the stickers. We can put these in an envelope. It's pretty simple. No problem. Uh, next thing is the shirts. We did have some trouble with the shirt order. Uh, we just got uh, proof that they fixed the problem they had, and, and they sent us the proof. So this is, it's got, they got it right where the NBS welding logo is on the chest. Then the great big NBS welding on the back. Uh... With the American flag on the sleeve. The way we like it. $25 for an NBS welding shirt. Uh, these will be here, supposed to be here September 5th. So we're taking orders. Got a couple orders already. Wayne and Mike, you guys, you're going to be getting your shirt. It's coming. Uh, next thing I want to talk about the, uh, the cup. Uh, my buddy tried to make these cups and I wanted the QR code on the cup and he couldn't figure out how to make it work. He made me cups. The QR code wouldn't scan. He said he didn't. He finally gave up. He wanted me, he wanted to give me my money back. I said, no, not all of it. We're going to share the responsibility. Anyway, uh, he gave me a portion of my money back. I gave him enough money to cover what he spent, but, uh, I continued to work on it and I got it worked out. I don't think my cups are as nice as his, but they work. And here's the thing. The QR code's got to be on the top where it's flat. If it's on the radius on the side of the cup, it's not going to scan. It's got to be on the top. I figured it out. But we got the cups. NBS Weldon with the bull logo. Got less yakking, more tacking. Uh, pretty simple cup. But like I said, I made this myself. I bought the cups and the materials. I put it together. Uh, had to make it work. I didn't want to quit on it. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, this real quick because this is something come up. Uh, a, a way for that you can give to the channel is through Super Thanks, through YouTube. And our guy Corey has given $100 Super Thanks repeatedly. And I keep thinking like, man, uh, this Corey uh, has contributed so much. I really want to do something to thank him. And I couldn't think of what I could afford to do. And I remembered these coins. Now, I had these coins made when I was making good money working in the oil field. And what this is, uh, this is one troy ounce of 0.999 fine silver. It says NBS Welding. It's got the name and phone number and the designation 0.999 fine silver. So this is an ounce of pure silver. And if you turn it over, it's got the bull logo on the back. This coin, this coin, I'm sending this to Corey to thank him for all the, all the super thanks that he's given. Um, there's one thing that, that is, there's two things about super thanks. It's super easy for you guys to contribute to a YouTube channel through super thanks because you can go on your device and you can hit super thanks and boom it's it's quick it's easy for you to do the problem with super thanks is youtube gets 30 percent of that money so out of a ten dollar super thanks you're giving youtube three dollars um but it's kind of like that with the merch too uh if a shirt's 25 dollars we have to buy the shirt so I have to put money in, you know, there's money going somewhere. Uh, 
anyway, this idea came up to, to give Corey a coin. And that's, it's got a real nice little plastic case I'll show you. I just put it back in the case. That keeps them from getting, getting fingerprints all over it. Here's the thing. Uh, when I got the idea that I was going to give Corey the coin, I wanted to offer it to everyone. So, if you're interested in a coin, $50. Uh, send Tina an email. nbswelding at aol.com and... Thank y'all.